Adoration Ode upon Cromwell's Return from Ireland, A. Marble. The eager young man is finished with his schooling and ready for action. He is full of courage and looking for a way to show it. Whatever gets in his way is used as proof of his worthiness of honor. He's a good leader and many places fall under his command for England. The power gotten, however, must still be maintained. This Horatian ode upon Cromwell's return from Ireland creates a hero in story. The forward youth that would appear must now forsake his muses dear, nor in the shadows sing his numbers languishing. Tis time to leave the books in dust and oil the unused armor's rust, removing from the wall the corslet of the hall. So restless Cromwell could not cease in the inglorious arts of peace, but through adventurous war urged his act of star, and like the three for lightning first, breaking the clouds where it was nursed, did thorough his own side, his fiery way divide. For tis all one to courage high, the emulous or enemy, and with such to enclose is more than to oppose. Then burning through the air he went, and palaces and temples rent, and Caesar's head at last did through his laurels blast. Tis madness to resist or blame the face of angry heaven's flame, and if we would speak true, much to the man is due, who from his private gardens, where he lived reserved and austere, as if his highest plot to plant the bergamot, could by industrious valor climb to ruin the great work of time, and cast the kingdoms old into another mold. Through ju though justice against fate complain, and plead the ancient rites in vain, but those do hold or break, as men are strong or weak. Nature that hateth emptiness, allows of penetration less, and therefore must make room where greater spirits come. What field of all the civil war, where his were not the deepest scar, and Hampton shows what part he had of wiser art? Where twining subtle fears with hope, he wove a net of such a scope that Charles himself might chase to Carisbrook's narrow case, that thence the royal actor born the tragic scaffold might adorn, while round the armed bands did clap their bloody hands. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but with his keener eye the axe's edge did try, nor called the gods with vulgar spite to vindicate his helpless right, but bowed his comely head down as upon a bed. This was that memorable hour which first assured the force and power, so when they did design the capital's first line, a bleeding head where they begun did fright the architects to run, and yet in that the state foresaw its happy fate. And now the Irish are ashamed to see themselves in one year tamed, so much one man can do that doth both act and know. They can affirm his praises best, and have, though overcome, confessed how good he is, how just, and fit for highest trust. Nor yet grown stiffer with command, but still in the Republic's hand, how fit he is, he is to sway, that can so well obey. He to the Commons feet presents a kingdom for his first year's rents, and, what he may, forbears his fame to make it theirs and has his sword and spoils ungirt to lay them at the public skirt. So when the falcon high falls heavy from the sky, she, having killed, no more does search, but on the next green bough to perch, where, when he first does lure, 
the falconer has her sure. That may not then our isle presume, while victory his crest does plume. What may not others fear, if thus he crowns each year? As Caesar he ere long to Gaul, to Italy and Hannibal, and to all states not free, shall climacteric be. The picnal shelter now shall find within his party-coloured mind, but from this valour sad, shrink underneath the plaid. Happy if in the tufted brake the English hunter him mistake, nor lay his hounds in near the Caledonian deer. But thou, the war wars and fortune's son, march indefatigably on, and for the last effect still keep the sword erect. Besides the force it has to fright, the spirits of the shady night, the same arts that did gain, a power must it maintain.